novel, novel meaning new analysis of the old snake rope, snake rope parable, often utilized in the Advaita Vedanta tradition. I mean, you know, you know the snake rope parable. Some, I mean, I'll, I'll say it in two sentences. The Sarparaju parable. Some, someone is going in twilight. Twilight meaning it's no longer a day, it's not yet light, and he sees, he sees something coiled before him, right? And he thinks that this is a snake, and he's afraid. He might act uh, brutally, trying maybe to kill the snake or something like this. So this reaction to the, to the alleged uh, snake before him, we call it classical Indian philosophy, as my friends here are teaching, are teaching you, we call this Dukkha, right? The snake stands for Dukkha. But then someone comes, some guru, if you want, comes and whispers in his ear. Or maybe no one comes, maybe he realizes himself. How is this? Uh, I mean, he realizes that, let's, let's say it in Sanskrit, he realizes that Rajun Iyam, this is a road, Na Sarpa Iti. Rajun Iyam, Na Sarpa Iti. It's a road. It's not a snake. Okay, so this is the classical parable. This is the classical uh, parable, and then when he realizes that it's, it's only a rope, and not a snake, this is what classical Indian philosophy might call moksh. Right? Until here you are with me. So now Gesi Bhattacharya tries to do something new. So he's, he's introducing the third stage of the snake. What happens after we, after we realize that it is not a snake, but a rope. This is where Kesi Bhattacharya comes into the picture. In Shankara Acharya, there is no third stage of the snake. <coughs> when you realize that this is not a snake, this is moksha. But, but listen to what Kesi Bhattacharya is trying to do. In the previous, obvious, referred to time and again two stages, the snake is perceived, the snake is perceived in twilight, if you wish, first as real, and then as unreal, namely first as a snake and then as a rope. But what happens next? For Shankara, there is no next. When you realize that the snake is in fact a rope, is in fact a rope, this is the moment of redemption, of freedom, of moksha. <coughs> and your anxiety is over, as also your conceptual error, avidya having mistaken a rope for a snake. But KCB begs to differ. According to him, now I'm quoting, though corrected, the snake is not forgotten. Though corrected, the snake is not forgotten. Writing in the Advaitic framework, as the title of his paper indicates, KCB uses the third stage of the snake in which he is neither or no longer exists, nor does not exist, to rethink, to rethink Shankara's notion of Maya. Again, I'm quoting it for you. The indescribable, indescribable, yeah, mean, yeah, Anil Vachania, but meaning that thing that was a snake and now is a rope, but what, what is it really? The indescribable should be not, but is still given in absolute mockery of thought. We continue to perceive a snake. We know that it is not a snake, but we still perceive a snake. It marks, in a sense, KCB writes, the frontier, the borderline between thought and faith, being the given limit of thought at one hand, and the promise of the annulment of givenness on the other. So now you need some bhasha, so let me try to, to explain what KCB is doing. This is to say that despite the correction, despite the correction of the snake in the second stage, correction from snake to rope, the snake is still felt, responded to, and in a sense, in absolute mockery of thought, even perceived. Moreover, following the encounter with the snake, which in effect had been a rope all along, the protagonist of this story, or the parable, or parable, moves on, carrying the snake within him. The snake is imprinted in his consciousness as a sanskara. 
You know what a sanskara is? Sanskara, karmic scar, if you want. It's such, it has the potentiality to be awakened whenever the protagonist sees a coin something before him again. KCP's real problem is the human, or the subjective as he puts it, mechanism, owing to which one produces snakes in the Advaiti formulation, and is inclined to be beaten by them. KCP's reading of the rock snake parable is creative in the sense that it shifts the spotlight from the second stage of the snake, conventionally taken as the final stage, to a new third stage. It thus extends the boundaries of the parable, using it as a potent tool for discussing what he sees as the crux of the matter, namely, I'm quoting, the hidden subjective defect through which the snake is still given even after its correction in the second stage. KCB's move is creative to the extent that after reading his analysis, one can no, no longer be satisfied with a two-stage analysis of the parable. And perhaps this is one of the features of something new and creative, that like the right piece of a jigsaw puzzle, it fits the broader picture so well that one can no longer do without it and feels that it must have been there all along. So before I invite my friend to translate for you in short, I want to say two things. The first thing is Kesi Bhattacharya is using an old Advaita story to be, I mean, he's using it, he's bringing it into a contemporary discourse. The discourse of his own time, the discourse is about consciousness, is about our gaze, is about what we see. Why am I seeing you the way I'm seeing you now? Why are you seeing me or seeing each other the way you see now? What is the, what is the gaze made of? Made of? Because you see, the gaze is not just a matter of, a, of optics. The gaze has so much cultural and psychological material with, behind it. The reason that I see you, you know that the Vyas, the, the famous commentator of, of Patanjali, in the Yoga Sutra, he, he speaks of our gaze as a matsya jala, as a, as, as a fishing net. So what, what, what creates, what is the material that this fishing net is made of? I, I hope that you understand the, the metaphor of the fishing net. The fish that are too small are not captured by the net. I, I see what I, am to, what I am taught to see. This is quite depressing. It means that we can, we so optimistic, we can extend what we see. So Kesi Bhattacharya is using an old Advaita parable in order, in order to discuss the materials that constitute our gaze. This is one thing. The second thing, the second thing is the political dimension. There is a political dimension. Now the word politics is such a risky politics. Who is this guy from Israel using the word politics in DAV college in Banaras? When I'm talking about politics, I'm talking about the colonial period. Kesi Bhattacharya was writing during the colonial period. So the point is, the point is, the point is that when he speaks of, of, of the rope and the snake, and when he speaks about the snake that was internalized, you realize that at one level he speaks about, about the, the, the European culture being internalized. And the point is that to, ca to catch snakes is, is something which is possible. I mean, there are people that know how to catch snakes. If you have a snake, if you see a snake, you might invite a, a snake catcher to catch it for you. But inner snakes, this, this begins to be, not begins, this is far more complicated. What do we do with inner, slave, with inner snakes that we internalize? In this, case, it's even, in this case, it's even more interesting because it's not really a snake. It's a rope that we misperceived as a snake and now we internalize it and we move on with this internalized inner snake, which in fact was not a snake from the beginning. Please, sir. It's my last picture of pizza, like I can borrow where I can sit. Hello. Yeah. 
सर किया तो भी किसी भी भारतीय दर्शन पे ही नहीं बल्कि कांड को देवी पे भी रखे हैं किस भट्टाचार्य का और उनका कॉन्सेप्ट जब भारत गुलाम था उसके बारे में भी लिखना चाहते थे और जैसे आपने जाना है कि उन्नीस सौ आठ उन्नीस सौ आठ में लिखी गई है महात्मा गांधी के बारे में तो शाम और हिंद स्वराज कैसे लिखा ये भी जल्दी जानते हैं महात्मा गांधी ने जब यात्रा के माध्यम से नाव तो लिखा उन्होंने उसमें एक चैप्टर ऐड करना चाहते हैं किसी भी नए तरीके से जैसे गांधी जी स्वराज के बारे में सोचना चाहते हैं वैसे ही कृष्णचंद्र भट्टाचार्य भी सोचना चाहते हैं इवन उन्होंने जब कांट और हेगर के ऊपर भाष्य लिखा या रचनाएं लिखी तब भी उनका आइडिया था कि भारतीय इतने गुलाम नहीं हैं सोच से कि आपके ऊपर नहीं लिख सकते हैं उन्होंने स्वराज की एक नई परिभाषा करने की कोशिश की ठीक है फिर जो वेस्टर्न आइडिया थे उस समय लगता था कि हम गुलाम हैं उनके शायद थिंकिंग से बाहर नहीं आ रहे हैं जो नैरो माइंड से सोच रहे संकट मानसिकता से सोच रहे हैं उसको उन्होंने बाहर निकालने की कोशिश की और इन्होंने भारतीय दास्ता भारतीय गुलामी की भी बात की जैसे गांधी जी करते थे कि गुलामी मानसिक होती है बाहर से नहीं होती है और उस मानसिक जड़ता या गुलामी को दूर करने के लिए जैसे गांधी जी ने प्रयास किया था वैसे ही प्रयास कृष्ण भट्टाचार्य ने किया और बोला उन्होंने कि इंडियन फिलोसफी में इंडियन क्या है भारतीय दर्शन में भारतीयता क्या है कि किस चीज को हम बोलेंगे कि ये भारतीयता है आप बताइए इन्होंने इंडियन फिलोसफी एंड फिलोसफी ऑफ इंडिया भारतीय दर्शन और दर, भारत का दर्शन क्या अंतर है इसमें इसमें इन्होंने जे के एक प्रोफेसर है मेरे भी मित्र है प्रोफेसर भगत वैनम उनका नाम लिया कि भगत वैनम का भगत वैनम यहाँ पर भी आए भी हैं तो उन्होंने बल्कि एक आर्ट की लिखी है उसके बारे में बात किया फिर इन्होंने मॉडर्न एक्सपीरियंस के बारे में बात किया कि किसी भी इंसान से लेके योग से लेके वेदांत से लेके जैन फिलोसफी से लेके इवन कान फेगर सबके ऊपर लिखा है और सब्जेक्ट इज सब्जेक्ट इज फ्रीडम और कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ फिलोसफी उनकी किताबें हैं उनकी राइटिंग्स हैं और न्यूनेस ऑफ क्रिएशन क्रिएटिविटी के बारे में बात की नवीनता और रचनात्मकता के बारे में बात की कि भारतीय दर्शन में नवीनता क्या है फिर बाद में आए उसके एकदम कॉन्सेप्ट थे कि उनके लड़के जो थे गोपीनाथ भट्टाचार्य जी बहुत ही क्षमा प्रार्थी हो करके उनके बारे में लिखते हैं कि ठीक है वो पंडितों को नाराज नहीं करना चाहते हैं जैसे बनारस ट्रेडिशन सिटी है कि जो वेदांत और न्याय या सांग्य की व्याख्या हो गई उसमें नवीनता क्या है जो व्याख्या पहले से चली आ रही है वही व्याख्या ठीक है पंडित ऐसा मानते हैं इसमें आप नवीनता क्या देना चाहते हैं इसलिए वो क्षमा प्रार्थी होते हुए के सी भट्टाचार्य के बारे में लिखते हैं कि मेरे पिताजी चाहते थे कि भारतीय दर्शन में नवीनता देखी जाए और उसकी नई व्याख्या दी जाए नया विश्लेषण किया जाए लेकिन फिर भी वो क्षमा प्रार्थी हैं क्योंकि उनको मालूम था कि यहाँ के लोग नाराज हो जाएंगे ठीक है अब इन्होंने शंकर के डॉक्टर मतलब शंकराचार्य की जो सिद्धांत है माया का सिद्धांत उसके ऊपर बहुत बनी गया है और वो वही प्योर फिलोसफी है वेदांत को वो जो एस्टमोलॉजी है या मेटाफिजिक्स है तो उन्होंने बोला कि शंकराचार्य रचु और सर के बारे में सिर्फ दो स्टेज की बात करते हैं आपको भ्रम कब होता है जब भ्रम ये होता है दूधा होता है शाम का समय होता है दिखाई नहीं देता है तो रज्जु क्या दिखाई देने लगता है सर के रूप में दिखाई देने लगता है लेकिन जैसे ही प्रकाश होता है जैसे ही लाइट आती है जैसे ही टार्च लेके जाते हैं रज्जु सर हट जाता है और रज्जु दिखाई देता है तो शंकराचार्य क्या मानते थे बिलीव करते थे जब ये जब प्रकाश आ जाता है अविद्या चली जाती है तो आपको मोक्ष हो जाता है यही होता है ना लेकिन केसी भट्टाचार्य इसके तीसरे स्टेप की बात करते हैं वो बोलते हैं कि जो सर का जो आपके अंदर घुसा हुआ मन में उस चीज को कैसे निकाल पाएंगे सर तो आपके अंदर है अगर सर का कॉन्सेप्ट आपके अंदर नहीं रहता तो उस उस रस्सी को देख कर के आपको डर ही नहीं होता तो वो जो सेकेंड स्टेप है अविद्या का जिसको शंकराचार्य मानते थे और अभी तक जो भाष्यकार मानते आए हैं उसकी नवीन व्याख्या के रूप में वो कहते हैं कि रज्जू 
ही दुख का कारण है सब ही दुख का कारण है सब का जो कॉन्सेप्ट आपके मन में बैठा हुआ आंतरिक भावना में बैठा हुआ है वही दुख का कारण है अगर वो कारण नहीं रहता इसलिए हम बोला कि स्काई कैचर बुलाते बुलाते पकड़ते कैसे होता तो अगर आप उससे पहले से ही डरे हुए पहले से ही मान लिया है कि इसकी भी एक्सप्लेनेशन इसकी व्याख्या ऐसे हो रही है तो आप उसी तरीके से सोचना शुरू कर देते हैं तो उन्होंने बोला कि जैसी सृष्टि वैसे दृष्टि जैसी दृष्टि वैसे सृष्टि आप अपने नवीन तरीके से क्यों सोचते हैं चीज़ों को जो आपको सिखाया गया है उसी तरीके से सीखने के लिए आपको बाध्य नहीं होना चाहिए बल्कि आपको उसमें नवीनता खोजनी चाहिए उन्होंने बोला कि जो हमारी थिंकिंग है हमारे जो सोचने का तरीका है वो हमारे कल्चर से हमारे आदतों से हमारे विश्वास से बनता है हमारी हिस्ट्री से बनता है और इस चीज़ को समझने का एक नया तरीका होना चाहिए ठीक है और स्नैक इज पॉगेटिव मतलब जब आप साफ हो जाते हैं तो आपका दुख खत्म हो जाता है तो वैसे ही आपके जीवन में जो आपने सीखा है उसको नवीन तरीके से अगर देखने लगते हैं तो जैसे स्नैक को फेल किया जैसे स्नैक को फील किया आपने कि ये सर्द है और उस फीलिंग से आपको डर होने लगेगा वो दुख है उस दुख को आपको हटाना है तो नई नई तरीके से और बोले कि जैसे मत्स्य से जल है जब मछली होती है कैसे वो अपना तरीके से चलती रहती है इधर उधर करती रहती है तो जो आपकी दृष्टि है वो क्रूसियल है और आप क्या देखते हैं कैसे देखते हैं वो मैटर करता है किसके दृष्टि से देखते हैं आपके अंदर है वो आपको करने की जरूरत नहीं है आप अपनी नई दृष्टि बनाइए नया अवलोकन कीजिए और नए तरीके से भारतीय दर्शन को फील करने की जरूरत है This is KCP. So now I'll tell you something about Venus in that Krishna, and then I will close. I think that this would be enough for one uh, session. So, so let me introduce uh, that Krishna to you. <coughs> so that Krishna was born in 2008, in 2019, and passed away in 2007. So he's a very contemporary thinker. Again, again, it is not easy to choose just a single instance of newness in that Krishna. His reading of classical Indian sources is so original that I always suspected that there was some judgment, some magic in his jashma, in his glasses. He read all the people, he read classical texts that people read for generations and generations but he managed to see something new. So I thought maybe there is some jadu in his chashma. In his inner chashma, there was some uh, jadu. Um, take for instance his paper, and again I, I, I want to, to, to share with you the title. Take for instance his paper, Adyas, a non-advaitic beginning in Shankara's Vedanta from 1983. Adyas, a non-advaitic beginning, beginning in Shankara's Vedanta. Here he reads Shankar's Brahma Sutra Bhashya and is puzzled by the very first sentence of Shankar's introduction in his famous, I mean, in his famous introduction, which is usually referred to as the Adhyasa Bhashya. In the opening sentence, again, that Krishna reads the Brahma Sutra Bhasha in the first sentence of the introduction, he finds something which he, which, he, which he thinks that is puzzling, unexpected. So the first sentence of, of Shankara's introduction says the following in English translation. The object, Vishaya, and the subject, Vishayin, manifested respectively in the ideas of you and I. Yushma and Asma to Pratyaya are different from one another like darkness and light and should not be identified with each other. I don't know if, I mean, I don't know if you read Shankar's introduction, so I'm reading to you this sentence again. The object and the subject manifested respectively in the ideas of you and I are different from one another like darkness and light and should not be identified with one another. That Krishna is surprised by Shankara's definition of adhyas as the mistaken identification 
of you and I. From an advaitic, advaitic, non-dualistic perspective, that Krishna thinks out loud, the error, the mistake, should be the other way around. For the Advaiti, the Shankara is supposed to be the champion of Advaita. Anything which diverts from the equation I am thou or I am you is an error. Why and how then that Krishna wonders yeah, that Shankara choose to open the introduction of his commentary with the formulation of Adhyasa, which is compatible with the dualistic position of his rivals from the Sankhya school of thought. Now I hope that you can follow what I'm saying even before the translation. This is the first sentence of the Vasha says of the object and the subject. The object meaning you and the subject meaning I are different from one another and should not be identified. But from Advaitic position, it should be the other way. You and I are one and the same. Actually the division the distinction is supposed to be the, the mistake, the error. This is what that, that Krishna suggests. So why does, why does Shankara open the, the, the Bhashya in such a way? I think that the, the, the importance of that Krishna's work is in the fact that he raises questions that are not raised before him. Because you see, we can, we can try and think about different answers. Maybe Shankara is starting with the Purva Paksha. With the, with the position of, of, of another school, of the Sankhya school. Or maybe Shankara Acharya is starting with the common sense view, because his listeners are not yet acquainted with the Advaita position. So you and I, this is common sense. You are there, I'm standing here. So, so, so we can try to find the answers. But the point is, I think that reading that, Krishna, you realize the importance of the question. Usually we think that the important thing is the answer not the question. So that Krishna changes the balance between questions and answers and tries to teach us how to ask a question. Now, I think that we really don't know how to ask questions. We are taught to find the answers. So usually in seminars, when the Q&A starts, when the Q&A session starts, no one asks questions. People are actually saying what they them themselves think under the title of the question, right? I'm not talking about clarification questions. What did you mean in the last sentence? A real question, a question that, that challenges the whole philosophical move. So that Krishna is the, the, is the great, uh, is the great uh, question, uh, if you want, scholar of contemporary India. So the full move about Adhyasa in the first sentence of Shankara Acharya can be found in Daya Krishna's paper Adhyasa, a non advaitic beginning in Shankara's Vedanta. And now I'm going to tell you the most important thing of my whole talk. Actually, now I'm going to tell you something for which I came all the way from Beijing to meet, to meet you. There's a website, a website called Daya Krishna, the open library. <coughs> If you, if, you, if you write in Google Daya Krishna, I think that the first result will be Wikipedia, and the second result will be the open library. So all of Daya Krishna's writings, both in English and in Hindi, are available online, waiting for you to, to, to come to this open library and to download these materials. On this website, you can also listen to Daya to audio recordings of Daya and the library grew. It is online now for 10 years. It was prepared by two younger colleagues of mine, one from Tel Aviv, Do Miller, and one from Vienna, Elise Kokero, who is now at the now at JMU. And you can, you can listen to Daya Krishna, you can download the Daya Krishna's uh, writings. And uh, I mean, this is the, the great secret that I came to, to share with you. So my talk here is just a window or a door to which you can enter and, 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 and really read or listen to so, so that Krishna, the open library, write it down in your memory. I wish to push forward with another illustration of newness in that Krishna, in that Krishna's reading of a classical Indian philosophy. In his essay, Socio-Political Thought in Classical India, Socio-Political Thought in Classical India, a paper that Daji wrote in 1997, he suggests that every political theorist 
should be interested in the radically, in the radically individualistic implications of the theory of karma. The radically, he writes, individualistic implications of the theory of karma, which lead, he argues, to moral monetism. Moral monetism. What is moral monetism? And why and how would the theory of karma lead to moral monetism? According to the theory of karma, as all of you would know, as much as me or maybe better than me, one's present position in the world is the causal result of one's actions in the past. Right? In the same way, one's present actions will determine one's future position. It is implied, and this is that Krishna's concern, that the karma theory leaves no place for the other, for you. The other, at best, is instrumental to enable me to bring to fruition the karmic baggage that I carry along, and hopefully to acquire, owing to my attitude towards him or her, punya, merit, good karma, that will, that will have positive future consequences.